Thank you, David. I, I requested that song. I love that song, and it pairs very well with the message we have for today. Let's see if I... Here we go. Um, this is a part two of the out-of-the-box message, um, and we will recap a little bit at the beginning. Uh, I will explain why this picture is at the front of the slides. It may not be what you think it looks like. So we'll circle back around at the end. I like circular things. <laughs> so we'll circle back around as we talk about this. Um, I mentioned last week that we we're talking about discipleship, and Jody has said that um, she is here for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, and we said that this is one side of the coin. That's out of Ephesians 4, 11, 13. The other side of the coin is to go and make disciples of all nations, which is the Great Commission. So this is a recap from last week. And you have to be a disciple to make disciples. There's a process there. Um, we're studying two lives, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. We're talking about identity. Um, their training and discipleship process, the, their practices and implementation of those practices, and how they discipled nations. First, we looked at a woman named Hadassah, or Esther, Queen Esther. She's known by many. Uh, now we're going to look at the uh, man that, whose life most people know him as um, Paul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, but just like we had Hadassah, that was her true given name. Who can tell me who the, what the given name of the Apostle Paul was? It wasn't Paul to begin with. Woohoo! <laughs> Y'all get extra points for that one. Good job. Yes. Saul. So his Hebrew name means prayed for. Um, Acts 22, 3. In his own words, he said, um, he was telling people who he was as a testimony to his experience in life. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of, uh, sl sorry, uh, Cilia. Silly I was raised here in Jerusalem and was tutored in the great school of Gamaliel. My education trained me in the strict interpretation of the law of our ancestors, and I grew zealous for God. Um, and Gamaliel, by the way, was the Pharisee doctor of Jewish law and was highly esteemed by his community. Um, he also, this is Paul, Saul, later tells the Sanhedrin um, that he's the son of a Pharisee. So if we're looking at his pedigree, pedigree you might say that he's like the Harvard, the Yale, the best of the best education in, in his faith um, and his, in his family. There's some pedigree there. Okay, I titled this slide a little too salty, thinking of um, the, the colloquial term we use now for somebody who's angry or irritated or upset. So this is where we first see um, Saul in Scripture in Acts 9, 1 through 7. Seven, I'm sorry, Acts 2, I jumped ahead, 2, 1 through 3. Some devout men um, buried Stephen, and this is after Stephen had been stoned for his faith. He, he was killed and mourned his passing with loud cries of grief. But Saul, this young man who seemed to be supervising the whole violent event, was pleased by Stephen's death. The very day, the whole church in Jerusalem began experiencing severe persecution. All of the followers of Jesus, except for the emissaries or apostles themselves, fled to the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Young Saul went on a rampage, hunting the church, house after house, dragging both men and women to prison. So we might say that Saul was a devout terrorist. He was convinced in his mind that these followers of the Jesus way were trouble for the Jews. And so he felt it was his personal mission to take it on and persecute them. So... Saul clearly had gone rogue from the teaching he was given from his mentor, his uh, uh, spiritual leader. And here uh, we see a little bit from Gamaliel, and he's giving his opinion about this whole Jesus way experience and that what they're seeing in the land. And he tells his uh, followers and students, his disciples, fellow Jews, you need to act with great care in your treatment of these fellows. Remember when a man named Theodos rose to notoriety? He claimed to be somebody important, and he attracted about 400 followers. But when he was killed, his entire movement disintegrated, and nothing came of it. After him came Judas, the Galilean fellow. At the time of the census, he also attracted a following. But when he died, his entire movement fell apart. So here's my advice. In this case, just let these men go. Ignore them. If this is just another movement arising from human enthusiasm, it will die out soon enough. But then again, if God is in this, you won't be able to stop it, unless, of course, you're ready to fight against God. That's out of Acts 5, 35 through 39. So clearly, 
Saul is not in line with his, the mentor that he had. He has a differing opinion, and so we'll see what happens as he goes about following his mission to uh, destroy followers of the Jesus way. Uh, it happens that he's going to Damascus to complete his mission to terrorize people. <clears throat> and in Acts 9, 1 through 7, it's uh, 17, I'm sorry. It's quite a lengthy part of scripture, but this is really important to his story and his transformation. Saul himself discovers the way. <clears throat> Back to Saul, this fuming, raging, hateful man who wanted to kill every last one of the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest in Jerusalem for authorization to purge all the synagogues in Damascus of followers of the way of Jesus. His plan was to arrest and chain any of Jesus' followers, men as well as women, and transport them back to Jerusalem. He traveled north to Damascus with a group of companions. Imagine this. Suddenly a light flashes from the sky around Paul, and he falls to the ground at the sound of a voice. The Lord says, Saul, Saul, why are you attacking me? Lord, who are you? Then he hears these words. The Lord says, I am Jesus. I am the one you're attacking. Get up, enter the city, and you will learn what to, you are to do. His other traveling companions just stand there, paralyzed, speechless, because they too heard the voice, but there's nobody in sight. Paul, Saul rises to his feet, his eyes wide open, but he can't see a thing. So his companions lead their blind friend by the hand and take him to Damascus. He waits for three days, completely blind, and does not eat a bite or drink a drop of anything. Meanwhile, in Damascus, a disciple named Ananias had a vision in which the Lord Jesus spoke to him. The Lord says to Ananias, Ananias, he responds, here I am, Lord. Get up and go to Straight Boulevard. Go to the house of Judas and inquire from a man, um, about a man from Tarsus. Saul by name, he is praying for me at this very instant. He's had a vision, a vision of a man by your name who will come. Lay hands on him and heal his eyesight. <clears throat> Ananias responds, Lord, I know who you're talking about. I've heard rumors about this fellow. He's an evil man and has caused great harm for your special people in Jerusalem. I've heard that he has been authorized by the religious authorities to come here and chain everyone who associates with your name. The Lord responds, yes, but you must go. I have chosen him to be my instrument, to bring my name far and wide, to outsiders, to kings, to all the people of Israel as well. I have much to show him, including how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias went and entered the house where Saul was staying, and he laid his hands on Saul and called to him, Ananias, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here sent me so you can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is interesting because Saul is traveling with his companions, and he's on his way to terrorize people. And he's, he's blinded by this bright light, and he hears this voice, and it's Jesus himself speaking to him. What's interesting to me is um, he's blinded. He's the only one blinded, and his companions are not, but they all hear the voice. So for me, it's like a physical manifestation of his spiritual reality because he had been blind to who Jesus was spiritually. So he's physically blinded, and it takes a follower of Jesus to lay hands on him for that to be healed. So... The voice reveals himself as Jesus, as we said, and gives him instructions on what to do next. Saul rises to his feet. This is super interesting. This is going to tie back to part one. His eyes are wide open, as it says in verse 8, but he can't see a thing. So his companions lead their blind friend by the hand and take him into Damascus. He waits for three days, completely blind, does not eat a bite or drink a drop of anything. Remember Esther's story. Her fast was for three days. Here he is fasting. I'm sure this is the prompting of the Holy Spirit. For three days, he doesn't eat or drink. And we said Esther was a precursor to Christ. A dead person doesn't eat or drink. Christ was crucified, buried, three days resurrected to save nations. Esther does it to save her nation. We're going to see Saul's journey here for a salvation of nation. He as well has this fast. So I, I, for me, I look for patterns in scripture. I look for things that connect um, people, ideas, situations. And this to me is astounding because we know who the Apostle Paul becomes. We're going to go back and talk about Saul's, Paul's mentors. Gamaliel was the first one we mentioned. Ananias became a mentor to him because he laid hands on him. 
And he fellowshiped with him. And then the other disciples in Damascus gathered around him as well. In Acts 9, we hear about that. Um, Barnabas later is one that's also mentioned. And he's instrumental in getting um, Saul, who later becomes Paul, in contact with and in fellowship with the Jews in Jerusalem. Because nobody wants to touch this man, right? They're like, you want us to hang out with who? Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement, is the encouragement that he needs. And he encourages both sides. He's the bridge. Um, we also have the other apostles. Now, disciple simply means student. Apostle, we typically interpret to mean sent one or sent out. But it's a weightier meaning. The, uh, the word apostolos actually comes from a Greek military term. The Greeks were a conquering people. So whenever they would conquer a nation or a people group, they would send out a military commander called an apostolos. And he would be the one in charge of changing the language, changing the practices, the customs, um, everything that that people group did so that they would look like the kingdom of Greece. They are culture changers. So it's a little weightier than just being sent. It actually is transformational in their mission. The voice of Jesus that stops him on the road to Damascus, that's obviously a mentor, and the Holy Spirit who leads him. And he becomes known as Paul. He takes on a Roman name. Why the, why the name change? The name itself means humble or small. <clears throat> we don't have a clear cut, like in a uh, story of Hadassah turning her name to Esther. The reason why is clear. We don't have a specific reason given in scripture. I kind of like to think of, of a witness protection program. <laughs> because everybody knows who Saul was. And nobody wants to hang out with that guy. But also, it's, he's called to the nations, and he takes on Rome as, as clearly the nation that's in charge of so much land, so much territory. He takes on a Roman name, a Latin name. <clears throat> so he was a Roman citizen. We read that in Acts 13, 37. Um, he's called to bring the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jews. He was multilingual. He, speaks, uh, he spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, which is the common conversational language of the day. Latin, which is the language of the Roman Empire, and he spoke Greek. And we consider him the apostle to the nations. And he is called to both, uh, anywhere he goes, he goes to the synagogue, so he speaks to the Jewish people about Jesus, but then he also goes to the other nations. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the things we're talking about in this process of discipleship is discipling nations. And one of my favorite stories, there's so much we can talk about with the Apostle Paul about where he goes and what he does. But one of my favorite sections is Paul at the Areopagus, and this is in Greece. And we see in um, Acts 17, 16 through 29, again, a big chunk of scripture, but there's so much here to look at, so we want to read through it. <clears throat> Paul found himself alone for some time in Athens. He would walk through the city, feeling deeply frustrated about the abundance of idols there. As in the previous cities, he went to the synagogue. Once again, he engaged in debate about Jesus with both ethnic Jews and devout Greek-born converts to Judaism. He would even wander around the marketplace speaking with anyone he happened to meet. Eventually, he got into debate with some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Some were dismissive from the start. Philosophers. What's this fast talker trying to pitch? Others. He seems to be advocating the gods of distant lands. They said this because of what Paul had been preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. This stirred their curiosity because the favorite pastime of the Athenians, including foreigners who had settled there, was conversation about new and unusual ideas. So they brought him back to the rock outcropping known as the Ropagus, where Athens intellectuals regularly gathered for debate, and they invited him to speak. This is significant to me because, I'm going to pause here, uh, we took a trip to the Greek Isles and, and ended up in Athens for a few days, and our tour guide said it was important. Nobody, not anybody could just walk in and start talking in this place. You had to be invited to speak. So he actually had an invitation to speak. And the Athenians say, May we understand this new teaching of yours? It's intriguingly unusual. We would love to know its meaning. Paul responds, Athenians, as I have walked your streets, I observe, observed your strong and diverse religious ethos. You are truly a religious people. I have stopped again and again to examine carefully the religious statues and inscriptions that fill your city. 
One such altar, I read this inscription, said, to an unknown god. I'm not here to tell you about a strange foreign deity, but about this one whom you already worship, um, though without full knowledge. This is the God who made the universe and all it contains, the God who is the king of all heaven and earth. It would be illogical to assume that a God of this magnitude could possibly be contained in any man-made structure, no matter how majestic, nor would it be logical to think that this God would need human beings to provide him with food and shelter. After all, he himself would have given to humans everything they need, life, breath, food, shelter, and so on. This God made all of us in our diversity from one original person, allowing each culture to have its own time to develop, giving each its own place to live and thrive in its distinct ways. His purpose in all this was that people of every culture and religion would search for this ultimate God, grope for him in the darkness, as it were, hoping to find him. Yet in truth, God is not far from any of us. For you know the saying, we live in God, we move in God, and we exist in God. And still another said, we are indeed God's children. And pause here before I read the last verse. That verse 28, Paul is quoting two classical Greek writers, Erastus and Cleanthes. He's um, quoting their writers. Since this is true, since we are indeed offspring of God's creative act, we, should think that the, we shouldn't think of the deity as our own artifact, something made by our own hands, as if this great universal ultimate creator were simply a combination of elements like gold, silver, and stone. So, recapping this long section, he observes their culture. He just takes a walk in town. He participates in their oratory practice by invitation. So he's honoring their, their systems that are in place. He speaks their language. He knows their poets and their writers. He speaks to a mystery that they don't fully understand. And he notes that every culture on earth has a witness and a testimony of the uncreated creator. And I love, I love languages. I'm a linguist. Aramaic, as I mentioned before, is the conversational language at the time that this is written. The Aramaic word for uh, creator is life giver. It actually means life giver. And that sp speaks to me because I'm Apache. And in the Apache language, life giver is also the word for creator. So there's a witness throughout creation. And that Paul says that to us. And he simply takes a walk, finds that witness within their cultures, and addresses them through that culture. It's an inside job. So back to Discipling Nations, I told you at the beginning that that first picture might not be what you think of when you think of Discipling Nations. It's, uh, this is a, taken a month ago. We were on a trip, and uh, one of the stops was in Panama. It was a cruise. Um, and we can, you know, you can take excursions. You can visit different places. We chose to go to the Embera tribe in Panama. And I felt the conviction because of uh, the customs of the Apache people and many tribes in North America we protocol. When you, um, the, the custom is if you go into somebody's land that's not your own, you ask permission. You go as a good guest, and you, you seek their permission to be there. Well, we had already known that they were going to provide us with a, a feast of tilapia, fried plantains, and um, pineapples. So they were welcoming to us to their land. And they were telling us about their culture, and they were showing songs and dances. Um, I felt like I needed to protocol them. So. Uh, knowing a little bit of history, the Spanish, when they came to South America, particularly Panama, they took a lot of silver and copper from the land. And so I brought a silver bracelet, or I'm sorry, a copper bracelet. And the other picture on the other side is the regional chief. I gifted the regional chief a copper bracelet, and I explained to everybody else who was sitting there from the excursion, as well as the tribal members that were there, why, why I was doing what I was doing to honor the people of the land. I also brought other gifts as I'm a teacher. I brought gifts for their um, tribal classroom, um, gifts for uh, an elder, the teacher, the chief's wife. Um, so, and then the picture you see with the little girl and the fan. And our regalia, for our native regalia, we use feather fans, but couldn't bring a bunch of feather fans, so I went the budget route and brought a bunch of Dollar Tree fans for air conditioning um, and passed those to the ladies. So the little girl has that. Now, as I'm talking about discipling, you think, oh, here she is discipling the Embera people. The people that were discipled in this situation were the cruise guests from America, from Canada, from Europe. 
my husband was sitting next to several ladies with tears in their eyes. And they were saying this is a good thing. They were being discipled about honoring people and what that looks like. So again, not necessarily what appears, but honoring boundaries, just as uh, the scripture says, he set boundaries in place. He set people in place for their specific times throughout history. And that's what's going on here. So recap of the message. I'm quoting myself on the first line here because I wrote a song called Pride of Right. And the lyric from that song is, being right doesn't mean that you're righteous. Paul thought that he was righteous in his mission of persecuting people of the Jesus way. He thought he was right, but he wasn't righteous. Um, going from being God's gift, Saul, that means prayed for, to humbling yourself when you're consumed with your own self-importance, changing to Paul, small or humble, is not a bad thing. Listen to wisdom and experience. Remember, listen to your mentors. When you're stopped in your tracks, it's always good to ask questions. Listen and course correct if you need to. There's no one that God cannot reach. Even if we can't see it or believe it, he asks us to believe the unbelievable. Remember the reactions of the disciples when they heard about Saul. You want us to hang out with who? That's impossible. And it took a son of encouragement, Barnabas, to make a way for him even to connect with the rest of the Jews in Jerusalem. He believed the unbelievable. So I would exhort you and encourage you to be like Paul at the Oropagus. Speak to people where they are in their language or in the manner of speaking that they have and according to their experiences and understanding. Honor all people, honor people, all people, as made in the image of God. Now, I also think of um, a few chapters back in Acts 10 where we have the scenario of Peter having this trance, and he's thinking about lunch. It's lunchtime. He's on the roof, and he has this vision of this, this sheet being lowered down with all these animals in it, and he, he hears this voice saying, Arise, kill, and eat. He's like, Lord, I, I, I don't touch anything unclean according to our law. And it's a revelation because at that moment, knocking at the door are Gentiles, and he's not supposed to associate with them. So this revelation is from every corner of the earth, clean and unclean, what he considers clean and unclean. Jesus is saying, no, no, these are all called by my name. And so he, he learns the lesson of this message of the Jesus way is not just for the Jews. And he has that experience. And he responds to the the guests that are there to see him, I'm learning that God doesn't show favorites. He's no respecter of persons. This is for all of us. So I've listed a couple of box busters. <laughs> Since this is out of the box, some of the things we do by tradition or by our words because we've been taught. And the first one is, are you a sinner saved by grace or a saint of the most high God? Sinner saved by grace, yes, that is our testimony, but it's not who we are now. If you've been transformed by the power of Jesus, you are a saint of the Most High God. And it was preached recently, we are a holy nation, a chosen people. I'm going to get this all mixed up. <laughs> Royal priesthood, chosen people, holy nation, right? So you'll either sin by faith because you self-identify as a sinner, or you'll do his works greater than Christ himself, which is what he intends for us to do if you identify as a saint. Now, the next one, we get tripped up with the word perfect. Everybody says, nobody's perfect, nobody's perfect. Yes, it's true, but it's because our culture, our society, has a very subjective view of what perfection is, and it's usually external, right? And it depends on person, person to person who you ask. But in Matthew 5.48, it says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You're like, that's pretty heavy. But that word in Greek, teleos, means mature, finished, complete and not lacking. We're not supposed to lack for anything. We're supposed to be mature. So don't think of it as the subjective societal view of what perfection is. And since we have the mission to disciple nations, we must acknowledge that God created all people and cultures. We're all made in the image of God, according to Genesis 1, 27. John, the Apostle John, while exiled on the Isle of Patmos, had this vision of every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping in heaven before the throne of God. That's out of Romans 7, 9. And we often pray on earth as it is in heaven. So we should see that on earth as it is in heaven. Every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping before the Lord. There's a witness of who greater is um, 
within each people group, so look for the opening just as Paul did. Honor the people he has made, and in doing so, you honor him. And, of course, we have a soundtrack. I promised you another song if you like music. Um, this song is actually written about Paul's experience at the Oropagus, and it's called Spiritual People, so you can look that up wherever you like to listen to music, YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Music. So um, I'm going to close out. I just want to pray for us, as I did last week, and just... Um, Lord, we just thank you for your grace on our lives. We just thank you that you make all things new, that you bust our boxes. So we're just asking you to bust our boxes where we have limited you, limited our understanding of your ways, because the scripture says that your ways are not our ways, your ways are higher. So we want to understand your ways, your higher ways that are not like ours. And we just pray that whatever you want to teach us through these, this series, God, that you continue to pour into us and pour out on us. In Jesus' name, amen.